Hey there, I'm Jim Cruz, lead pastor of Atmosphere Church. Thank you for listening to our church podcast. Our desire is to lead you in experiencing God by following Jesus. If you want to find out more about our church, head over to our website at atmosphere.church. I'm praying today's episode will touch your heart and change your life. We're so grateful for you guys, and uh, drop us a comment and let us know where you're watching from today, and we're so grateful to have you a part of our extended Atmosphere family, but if you are just joining us for the first time, I want you to know you're, you're walking into the fifth week that we've been talking about the subject called The Unshakable Kingdom. And what I love about this series is there's a whole lot of shaking going on these days in our world, right? Week one, we did the series. We literally had an earthquake, you guys. And uh, fortunately, it didn't follow the trend. Each week there was an earthquake, thank the Lord. Uh, But there is a lot of shaking going on in the world, not just with earthquakes and hurricanes, but it seems like the economy, the political landscape, there's a lot of stuff. And, And the invitation in the series is even though the world is shaking, we don't have to. Because we are a part of the unshakable kingdom of God. And uh, so we are in week five. Uh, last week, I just, I sat in that kingdom manifesto. Give me a wave if you're part of a life group. Give me a wave and all right, yeah. Uh, you guys sat in this uh, as well in life group this week. But I just felt like, man, I, I want to revisit this kingdom manifesto before we move forward into our, our new talk this week. And I just want to review it, especially for those of you that weren't here. But I took it back. Sometimes I'll get home from preaching and I'm like, I could have like said that better. And uh, there's a thing called Monday morning blues that pastors will get, like the, the regret of like, I shouldn't have said this, I should have said this. So I went home and I kind of reworked the, the kingdom manifesto. And there is a manifesto that we live by. Maybe we've never said it. Maybe we've never articulated it. But as we're in the series, I thought it would be really good for us to like create one that we can just kind of sit in. And I, I said it this way, as Jesus rules as my king, I am to embody the love, generosity, and compassion of my king and strive to live as he lived to infect the world around me with his unshakable kingdom. Now, what I love about this breakdown is the word strive there because nobody is going to live out the unshakable kingdom perfectly. God is not into perfection as much as he's into progression. He wants you progressing more and more towards his kingdom. But I love this word strive because that, that just means like we're, we're moving ourselves uh, towards this, this unshakable kingdom intentionally. And then it says this would include sharing with others the incredible love that God has for them and how he wants a relationship with them. So you share it. Uh, bringing healing to the hurting and hope to the hopeless. So, so that, that is activated in you. Caring for the poor and the marginalized. Forgiving people who have offended me, wounded me, or hurt me. And going to places and being with people who are looked at by most religious people as people I shouldn't associate with. Now you could take a picture of this, but you could also go on Instagram. Because I posted this on my personal Instagram, at PJ Cruz. All right? But it's not like my cousin Tom. It's C-R-E-W-S, like Terry Cruz, my other brother. Um, So PJ Cruz. And I, you can like look at this and maybe sit in this in your devotional time this week and just ask the question, Lord, how am I doing? How, how am I living in alignment with this manifesto that you've given to us? And, and really, this manifesto comes from the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapters 5 through 7. Now, as we talk today, we're going to move from kingdom manifesto to what I call kingdom values. So if you're taking notes, or you can open our app and you can follow along, but write that down, kingdom values. And I I don't know, Taryn, you're pretty quick on the draw. She's our pro presenter. Can we get up for Taryn? She's amazing. All right. The tech, the tech booth never gets any love, and they're like literally holding our whole service together. All right, so I can't appreciate them enough. But I want to go over to the the definition of values because I, I think like as I looked at last service, I go, I need to probably start with this definition. So, uh, how would we define values? It, values is a person's principles or standards of behavior 
one's judgment of what is important in life. So there's a standard of behavior. Now, every kingdom, you guys, every culture, every country, every nation has standards. Now, they take these standards and they make laws and, and they have, you know, fines and, and punishment if you don't abide by the laws. And, and I was looking this week at some ridiculous laws that are around the world in different nations. And I just was like, man, it's so crazy to think about these laws. But the first one that really caught my attention was in Iran, it's illegal to rock a mullet haircut. It is. It's, it's illegal. And... And I, I just thought, like, wow. Some of you are like, I wish that was true in the USA. Because have you guys noticed the young adults are rocking mullets again? I just love it, all right? I wish my wife would let me bring my, my mullet back. But she's like, no way, dude. It's not going to happen. But I, I just think about this. This is so such a wild rule, and I, I guess because they don't like the, the Western culture in Iran. But by the way, here's a fun God story for you that in Iran right now, it's been reported by multiple people to me as a pastor that Jesus is appearing in people's dreams that are living in Iran. And, and there is a great awakening happening in Iran for the kingdom of God. And I just thought that was so cool. Uh, here's another one for you. Uh, in Japan, there's a, there's a law. This is not like an old law. This just passed. In Japan, there, there are strict regulations on the size of your waistline. It's called the Metabo Law. And it requires the people ages 40 to 74 have their waist measured annually to ensure they meet a government-mandated standard. The government has set a maximum waist size for adults, and those who exceed it may be required to participate in weight loss programs. Wow. Japan. In France, it's illegal to name your pig Napoleon. For obvious reasons, they, they think it would be insulting uh, to their great leader uh, in history uh, to name your pig Napoleon. <laughs> Here's a fun one. Uh, my grandma was from Scotland. Uh, any Scottish blood in the house? Uh, Scotland, it, it is the law that if anybody comes to your house and needs to use the restroom, by law, you have to let them in your house and let them use the john. Yeah, it's true. So, so you don't you don't have a right like, it's like hey man, I got to use the bathroom. They can come in your house and and uh, you, you know take take their time and go into the, your bathroom. In Samoa, it's illegal to forget your wife's birthday. <laughs> I don't know how this law happened. I don't know if the, uh, there was a queen in power and she got burned out that her husband forgot her birthday. She's like, it is against the law to forget any wife's birthday. In Singapore, it's a criminal offense to chew gum. How many already knew this rule? So there, these are good to know, like before you travel abroad, uh, that uh, your first offense, if it's non-medicinal, your first offense is a fine of $1,000. A second offense will cost $2,000 along with community service. Crazy. Just a... Just a snippet of, of these laws and standards that other countries and nations have. But the reason I, I kind of wanted to start off this way is because it might be a foreign concept to you as we talk about the kingdom of God, that the kingdom of God, or as we know it also in scripture as the kingdom of heaven, which by the way, in the New Testament is mentioned about a hundred times. Jesus himself mentions it about 60 times, that the kingdom of heaven has a standard with it. There, there are these ways that the kingdom of heaven is to operate. So within, when you're within the boundaries of the kingdom of heaven, there is a lifestyle that is connected with it. And, and we have to talk about this because listen to what Jesus says himself in Matthew chapter 4. Before he gets into a sermon on the mount, he says this. He says, from that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, that word repentance is kind of a religious term that really, I think, has lost its value over the last maybe couple centuries here. 
because it, it's a negative term, but really it's a positive term, that there's an invitation that Jesus is inviting us into to move our life a different way. The, the word literally means to change directions. And, and to repent means to change your mind and, and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to choose to live a different way. So Jesus is saying the time to choose to live a different way is now because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So there's a new way that the kingdom is causing us to operate in. Now, my father-in-law, who's a pastor in Bakersfield and Tara's dad, and he's my spiritual mentor, he, he gave this illustration years ago. And remember, we're all from Bakersfield. So cowboys is kind of what we do in Bakersfield. You guys smell the cows when you drive through there. There's, there's a lot of cowboy DNA in Bakersfield. And I love this illustration. He said, hey, if I were to create a cowboy club uh, and say that in order to be a part of the cowboy club, there's some requirements. The first requirement is you have to own a cow. Second requirement is you have to get together with all the other cowboys and cowgirls once a week. And then the third requirement would be that you attend a couple rodeos every year. And in order to experience the benefits of the cowboy club, you'd have to do these things. And the benefit is you get to use the big ranch. You have an all-access pass to use the big ranch, which has everything that you would ever need or want as a cowboy. You get to experience the big ranch if you do these requirements. So the, the illustration is if somebody comes up and says, I want to be a part of the cowboy club, but I, I don't own a cow, then the person that is running the cowboy club has the ability to say, well, then you can't experience the big ranch because you're not, you're not fitting the requirements of, of like doing what it takes in order to experience the benefit of being in the cowboy club. And I, I this is like a weird illustration, but when her dad gave that to me years ago, that just, like the nickel drop, that, that just made sense. I go, yeah. I mean, whoever designed it gets to choose the standard for how you're living within that region or for how you're living within that space. And so the kingdom of God is a space in which God is king. That's what a a kingdom is. It's, It's a dome in which there is a king. And so if you're saying, I want to enter into the kingdom of heaven then what you're doing is you're making a uh, decision to say, I'm going to choose to make Jesus as my king. And here is what you need to understand. In order for Jesus to be king, we follow his rules to come under his rule. We follow his rules to come under his rule. Now, here's the tricky thing about the kingdom of heaven. It's both inclusive and exclusive. It's inclusive in the sense that everybody is invited into the kingdom of God. Everybody, no matter what you've done, where you've been, or who you've been with, you're invited to live in the kingdom of heaven. It's inclusive, but it's also exclusive, meaning that once you decide that you are going to come into the kingdom of God, which means that Jesus is ruling and reigning as your king, now there is a standard of how you're going to live your life that's different than the standard of how you've been living your life. There is the repentance. I was living this way, going this direction, but now that Jesus is ruling and reigning as my king, I'm turning and I'm heading this direction. Now, what makes this message so hard, and you might want to take back your appreciation of me, but I've just got to tell you the truth, all right? I'm, just, I'm here to tell you the message, but I'm not the one that made this up. Jesus made this up. So a lot of us, we love Jesus because Jesus fits in our pockets, all right? This is say hello to my little friend. This, for those of you that are Atmosphere OG, you know Pocket Jesus has been with us since we started the church. Pocket Jesus got me through COVID because I couldn't preach to people. I was preaching to a camera, so I put Pocket Jesus on the end of the camera. It's like, at least I got Pocket Jesus to preach to. But I bring up Pocket Jesus every once in a while because if we're honest with ourselves... We love the concept of Jesus forgiving us. We love the concept of Jesus saving us. We love the concept of Jesus rescuing us. But then we just go and live our life however we were living before. This this kingdom of God requires a king-sized Jesus, not a pocket Jesus. See, pocket Jesus is you just keep living however you want, and then when you need him, you just pull him out of your pocket. So when you're talking about the kingdom of heaven, Jesus is king size, you go in his pocket. Come on, somebody. You, you fit in his pocket. You go where he goes, and, and you, you're just along for the ride. So a, a lot of people, 
they, they love Jesus as Savior, but they're stopping short of loving him as their king. And one of the takeaways I hope that all of you are really embracing is that Jesus is inviting you into his kingdom, but in order to do that, you have to move from Savior to King. And that's how you are able to experience the kingdom of heaven. Now, as I talk about this, I, I want to give you a scripture that I think is so jolting because I, I want us to read this like with a fresh way of looking at with this kingdom of God in view because this is one of the passages where the kingdom of God is mentioned outside of Jesus. The Apostle Paul is writing this letter to the Galatian church, and this is what he says. He says, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, Jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Let's sit in that for a second. Take a deep breath. Because some of you, I just described your lifestyle in that little short paragraph. It says you're not inheriting the kingdom of God. Now, I, I will say there, there is an eternal value of what Paul is writing, that there is eternity in view. Everything we do on this earth has eternity in view. So there is an eternal value of the kingdom of God. But I believe it's so much grander than just what happens when we die. I, th I think the real like deep meaning here is what happens to us while we live. Because the kingdom of God, Jesus says, is now. It's this space and it's this place where, where God is reigning. And, and when we are living according to his ways and living under his rule for our life, then there's a lot of things that we are experiencing that we would otherwise never experience because we are coming into the kingdom of God where there is fullness of life. Every ancient civilization built the, the town or built the kingdom with walls and gates. And the whole reason they did this was protection against the invading armies and the enemies that wanted to come against the kingdom. And so they would build these walls and they would make these gates. And I want you to know the kingdom of God is no different. That there are boundaries that God is calling us to live with that are actually not about restriction as much as they're about protection. And you don't need a pastor to preach to you this whole thing. And, and you certainly don't need a, a Bible verse because some of you have lived in these spaces where you know that, man, when you give yourself over and do however you want with, and you don't have any boundaries set up in your life, man, you can, like, invite all kinds of disaster into your life. People living however they want to live and following their own desires have had their families blown up. They've had their finances ruined. They've even, in some cases, ruined and destroyed their own health. But Jesus is saying this. He's saying in John 10.10, 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come that they may have life and have it in all of its fullness. What the kingdom is doing is inviting us in to experience the fullness of God for your life now. I want you to think about that for a second. So, so God has your best intentions at heart. He made you. He created you. He created me. And, and there is a way that you can live where you experience the fullness of life that God always purposed you to live. But there's also a way you can live that can destroy those purposes and can rip you off from the fullness of God in your life, from experiencing that fullness of God in your life. And let me give you one example, and I could give you a whole list of examples, but this one is the example that I'm choosing to use because it is shocking to me as a pastor who's been following Jesus now for 35 years to hear this recent Pew Research Center poll. This is, mind you, this is a poll that was taken by people that claim to be followers of Jesus. According to this recent Pew Research Center poll, 
61% of self-entitled or identified Christians said they're fine with casual sex without being in love. Only 11% said they were waiting until they were married. Only 11% waiting until marriage. Now, this is shocking to me because I... I really was was in this uh, 80s and 90s movement, and now that's been branded the purity culture, like that's a bad thing. And, and, and what has happened is that there's been a shift within people that claim to be followers of Jesus that are living a lifestyle that is in alignment with culture more than it is with the kingdom of God. That we're living in a time that they call it the hookup culture. And a matter of fact, I didn't know what this term meant until a few years ago when I was telling a guy at church, like, hey, bro, let's hook up this week. And my son heard me. He's like, don't ever say that again, Dad. Don't ever say that. It means something different now, not like it did in the 80s. So I didn't know this. I was unaware of it. That's why I, I quickly started calling my, uh, you know, my shoes flip-flops. You know, in the 80s, we used to call those thongs. And I, I just, I stopped calling them thongs just a few years ago because every time I'd say thongs, people were like, don't say that again. Like, those are flip-flops. They're not thongs. And so I go, okay, duly noted. But as, as I think about this, you guys, like, it, it's pretty common that when you are, are into somebody that you just jump in bed with them. And you just have this intimate act, and I'm trying to keep it as PG as I can because I know there's littles in here, and, and this is a, a great plug for Atmosphere Kids. And I don't typically go here, but I just, I'm so, I'm, I'm just so blown away by this. Like, it, it is so prevalent. This isn't, I don't expect the world to act godly, but I certainly expect people that claim that, that they belong to the kingdom of God to, to live differently than the rest of the world. But here I'm like, I'm, I'm almost like I'm speechless. Like how, how could we like move so much into this area? And it just blows my mind because, I, I mean, Jesus, he spoke about marriage. And he spoke about what marriage is in Mark chapter 10. He, he goes on record to, this is in context of divorce, by the way. He says, but at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. So he's united to his wife before they become one flesh. Did you catch that? So Jesus is giving us the Genesis 1 and 2 model of how God has created everything to be worked out and lived out. And so Jesus is commending that. Now, if you follow the sexual ethic from Genesis to Revelation, you will, you will see clearly that God's desire is for you not to be intimate with somebody that you are not married to. The marriage covenant is there so that you can become intimate. You become one with somebody that you, you really, really know. And that's the idea of a covenant relationship. Is like you're not going to cross this line until this covenant is made. And you're not going to create a covenant with somebody until you really know that that is a person you should be with. In biblical times, they, they would do, you know... Uh, betrothed their, their sons and daughters, and, and they had to marry people. I wish they would bring that back, okay? It would just make it so much easier for our young people, and mom and dad would be extremely happy, right? Um, I didn't want that when I was a teenager, but now that I'm a parent of young adults, I'm like, we need to bring that one back, all right? But as I, as I think about this idea, and I, and I look at the culture that we're living in, there is a call of God to live a different way with Jesus being our king. Not to take our cues from culture, but to take our cues from God. And just setting scripture aside for a moment, if you think, like, when you give yourself over to your desires, a, a lot of times, it's like, have you ever been somewhere and you bought like some software and you're up there at the cashier and you have to read quickly through the agreement and you're going through like you're scrolling through like 10 pages to get to the very end where you sign you click and say I agree and you sign how many of you have stopped and read every paragraph before you just clicked on the box and said I agree and you signed your name now there might be some attorneys and you're like I do it every time well good for you but 99% of us are going to the bottom and saying, I agree, let me have that thing. 
And that's what we're doing. And, and I think what happens is we see all the fun and we see all of the, the, the glitz and glamour of these decisions and, and there's fine print. It's in like size five font where like your cheaters don't even allow you to read it properly. And, and, and the, it's just like bare, very minimal. And then we're just signing our life to certain lifestyles and doing certain things, not realizing the baggage that is attached to living that kind of way. And I, and I started thinking about like when, when you are one with somebody that is not your spouse, is not your husband, not your wife, what happens is the, the waters get muddied. And, you know, you can be in a relationship and there could be red flags. This guy is so toxic. He's a narcissist. Everything in you is like run away. But because you've been intimate with him, there's, there's this, uh, this, this pull that this person has on you. And even though everyone around you is going, run, lady, get away from that guy. You're like, oh, I don't know, but I kind of love him. Because you've crossed a threshold that is making it super confusing for you. If you had not crossed that, it would have been easy for you to say, no, thank you. So your emotions get really muckied when you cross this line with somebody that's not your spouse. And when that, come, that time comes where you reveal like there's some toxicity with her. And you're just like, I shouldn't go for her because of all these things. Now it's all muckied up because you've been intimate with her. And now you're like obsessed with this person that you should be running away from. And the whole time that you're obsessing with her, you are not making yourself for the one that God is calling to be your wife. And so you're so like, you see how it can mess you up emotionally? The, the word that we use in, in church language is soul ties. And it may be not the perfect expression for this idea, this understanding, but when you're intimate with somebody, you're tying yourself to that person emotionally as well as physically. There's an attachment. There's, you're giving a piece of yourself away. So there's this emotional baggage that you're allowing in that can help or, or that can hurt you as far as discerning whether or not you should be with this person. And then, I mean, there's the common STDs that the world talks about all the time. I'll never forget one of the, the hardest phone calls I ever had as a pastor. This lady was on the, on the, uh, the husband was on the phone. He just got married to this lady and she had herpes. And he's on the phone with me saying she's like crying. She can't stop crying because like she didn't reveal to him before they got married that she had this STD. And now she's embarrassed because she's knowing that she's going to be intimate with her new husband. And, and he's needing me to just pastor him through this moment because he doesn't even know how to comfort her because she is so... Uh, upset at herself for giving herself away and, and picking up this disease that, that if she had just waited and just kept herself pure, like this STD wouldn't be on her body. Now there's grace there. And I will talk more about that in a little bit, but that doesn't eliminate or erase how messy this situation is when God is calling us to live a better way, a way that there's fullness of life. And then you've got unintended pregnancies, you, you sleep with somebody like this, then ladies, you can get pregnant. And what you find in this culture is just like pregnancy is just like an inconvenience now. And I'm like, man, God, help us that we look at pregnancy as an inconvenience when in reality, pregnancy means that God has knitted and made a human being inside of your body that has a purpose, that has a calling. It doesn't matter the context of how that human was being created. The fact is that there's a human inside of you. And sometimes it can be so scary, especially if you're young. And this is why people that are teenagers, they, they shouldn't be sexually intimate with somebody. I mean, they, they're not prepared for marriage and they're not prepared for parenting. And so you get into this really complex thing and now people are having to make really, really difficult decisions. And we live in a pro-abortion state where it's so easy to get in your car and drive down to Planned Parenthood and get rid of this inconvenience when I'm thinking to myself, how come Planned Parenthood is not saying it and telling people that if you do an abortion, if you have an abortion, that there is a, a chance, there is a possibility that in that abortion, you can make yourself sterile for the rest of your life. And when you do want kids, you're not going to be able to have kids. And some of you are like, that, that's not true. I know that's not true. Well, fact check me, go to Mayo Clinic. And more than that, I will tell you a personal example. I was praying for a lady. Tara and I were just so close to this woman. And in her 
early years of being a young adult, she gave herself to this guy a couple times, different guys, and she got abortions. And then she came to a place where she found the man of God that she wanted. She got saved. She, she gave her life to Christ, and they were living in this Christ-centered marriage. And now it came time to have babies, and she found out that she can't because of two botched abortions that just ruined her, her whole uh, reproductive system. And, I, and I, hear, I hear politicians' reproductive rights, and I, he, I hear all of that, but I'm like, why aren't you telling people the fine print here? That it's not as easy as just going down to a clinic. There are repercussions. There are, there are fallouts. There's collateral damage that is happening with these decisions. And I know that the topic of abortion is complicated, and I know even me mentioning it, some of you are like on pins and needles going, oh, is he going there? This is a human life that is in the womb. This is not a fetus. This is not a clump of cells. This is a human life. The minute that heart beats and the minute the blood is flowing, that, my friend, is a baby. It's not a fetus. It is a baby that has a plan and a purpose of God. And say, that offends me. I'm sorry it offends you, but I want you to know that God values life. And if you have a problem keeping that baby, you come to us. And I will say the same thing that Mother Teresa said about abortion. And somebody asked her, how do you feel about abortion? She said, if you don't want your baby, give your baby to me. And if that works for Mother Teresa, that works for Pastor Jim Cruz. And I will tell you that, that we will take care of that baby. And we will, we will love you through the whole process that you don't have to turn to these ways. And, and God will redeem even the, the worst situation. But, but I, I just, I don't mean to get on a tangent about abortion, but this thing really, it hurts my heart that we have a bunch of young adults growing up in a culture that is a hookup culture, and they're letting that be brought into the kingdom of heaven. And the word of God says, listen, you will not inherit the kingdom of heaven if you live this lifestyle. You are not going to have the fullness of life that Jesus intended you to live with if you continue to give your body away to anybody that just happens to say you're cute. Are you guys okay? I don't know if I am. Here's the, Jesus just thinks the kingdom of heaven is the most awesome thing that you could ever want. Listen to how he describes it, Matthew 13. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and he bought it. Jesus has given us two parables to say, you guys, the kingdom of heaven is so awesome that you're going to want to get rid of the baggage. You're going to want to get rid of your own desires and the things that you want because what God wants for your life is so much better than you want for your life. That's what he's saying. It's like, why, why wouldn't you want this? Now, as you look about the kingdom of God and you look about Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and I encourage you as a life group, look, look through chapters 5 through 7. Read the whole sermon. The greatest sermon ever preached by Jesus, Sermon on the Mount. And if I were to break this thing down, I would break it down into the three categories. Jesus talks about, um, he talks about spiritual values. He talks about social values, and he talks about moral values in, in the sermon. So as a kingdom of God person, repenting of the way you've been your, living your life, and now you're moving a different way towards what God wants for your life, then there's implications. And, and he seems to put premiums on certain things. And so let's just write these down. The first one, let's talk about this spiritually speaking, because it really, it starts with the spirit. You can't live a kingdom life without the spirit of God living in you. You have to have the Spirit of God living from the inside in order for you to live the kingdom on the outside. But he says this. He says in Matthew 6, 33, but seek first the, his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. So I like to say this real simple. God first. Look at your neighbor. Say God first. God first. God first in everything. God first. There, you can have a second. You can have a third. You can have a fourth. You can have a whole list. But if you want to be a kingdom of God person, you put God first in everything. 
You put God first in your family. You put God first in your job. You put God first in your finances. You put God first with your health. You put God first, and then Jesus promises that everything else will be taken care of. Then there's, you know, in this whole sermon is the Lord's Prayer that we covered in the pursuit. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says, this is how you pray, you guys. Don't go and pray so everyone has a party for you. Like, pray in the closet. Pray that, you know, uh, in, in a, such a way that you're really being intimate with God. And then he breaks it all down in Matthew 7, verse 7. He says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. What is the invitation? Jesus says, if you want to live in my kingdom, where I'm reigning and ruling as king, you give me your stuff. You ask for me to get involved. You knock and I'm going to answer the door. You seek and you're going to find the truth. This is spiritually. Number two is socially. There are social values attached to the kingdom of God. Matthew 7, verse 12, it says, So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Now this is what culture has defined as the golden rule. And isn't it so fun that it came from Jesus? Some of you have heard this all of your life. Well, you know, do to others what you would have them do to you. That came from Jesus. The golden rule from the golden king. Come on, somebody. It's like, he's like, this is how I, I've designed you to live socially with each other. And if you do, man, it is gonna, you're going to experience the fullness of life. And then Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15 says, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others of their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. It's like, ooh, ouch. But you can see the premium he's putting on, like living a life full of forgiveness towards other people is the way that you're going to have the fullness of life for yourself. This is the way of the kingdom. He talks through uh, importance uh, of reconciling with relationships. He says, if you, are, if you know a brother is upset at you, he says, leave your offering at the church and you go and reconcile with your brother. That's the importance that God puts on relationships socially with other people. He says, I don't, I don't want you walking messed up. How many have ever been in a messy relationship, and it just like freezes your brain from thinking about anything else. God's like, go take care of that. That relationship is important to me. He's giving you the ministry of reconciliation. He talks through the subject of divorce, and I know a lot of you in this room have been divorced, and a lot of you, it wasn't your fault, and, and you, you just had to live with this, this setting of divorce, but Jesus talks through divorce. I think it's interesting. But then the moral values, this is probably the one we, we, we get a little uneasy with because it's like, wow, uh, who is Jesus to tell me what I can and cannot do? Well, he's the king. <laughs> so he gets, to, he gets to call the shots in your life. And, and remember, he's not doing this for your restriction. He's doing this for your protection so that you can experience all that he has for you. Matthew chapter 5, verse 8 says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Purity, that, that word means to be unmixed. That means that you're, you're staying away from all the other cultural pulls on you because you're just like, man, I, I want to see God. There's, there's some people in this room, maybe watching it online, you're walking in confusion. You don't know what God is saying to you because of your lifestyle is making God's voice so muckied up. And you just can't hear him. You can't see him. And it's because your lifestyle is keeping you from actually seeing him. And there's a call of God in the kingdom to live purified so that you can really see God and pay attention. Can, have you ever driven in the fog before? I mean, I grew up in Bakersfield. As I told you guys, man, there's a thing in the winter that is called the Thule fog. Tara, at 16 years old, she got lost in the fog and ended up in Taft. If you guys don't know where Taft is, it's like three times worse than Bakersfield. All right, this is bad. It's like you ended up in town. She, her and her 16-year-old friend just cried. It's a true story. But that's what happens, I think, and a lot of times it's like, what? how did I end up here? Well, my friend, God has a way for you to live, and you weren't living that way, and now you ended up where you're at. You're in Taft. And God's called you to live in Thousand Oaks. There's control over anger. There's, forgive me if you're from Taft, by the way. Um, Lust and, and sexual immorality is mentioned in, in the sermon. It's just, these are things that, man, pastors aren't preaching this. And I, and I, I, I got to apologize to you. A lot of times I don't go over a laundry list because I just think, duh, we all know this. But then I read this Pew Research and I'm like, I guess we don't know this. 
Sometimes, as your pastor, I have to spell it out for you. I'm going to stand before God. I'm allowed to pray that. I have to stand before God. And I don't want to stand before him and say, hey, I had a whole group of people that never were able to find their way into the kingdom because, Jim, you never led them there. I have to speak this stuff. Even if it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable for you. It's uncomfortable for me having to tell you guys this. But it's necessary because it's the truth. Listen to what Paul says. Paul talks a lot more about this than, uh, than anybody, probably, um, even more than Jesus. Because he, he was dealing with the Corinthian church who, they were in all kinds of stuff. They, they came from a very messy culture. They had temples to foreign gods that one of the, the worship practices was to have sex with a prostitute before you... Uh, like went into the temple. That was like, they were temple prostitutes. And so Paul was dealing with that. And a lot of times I've heard people say, you know, the Corinthian church is a lot like the Californian church. And I'm like, what California church have you been to? <laughs> it's not happening here. But I, I do understand the nuance as far as like, there's cultural values specifically for our state that if you go to any other state, they'd be like, man, that's crazy that you guys live that kind of a lifestyle in California. But listen to what he says. He says, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God. You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. You know what would simplify so much for our life? Is to simply ask a question before we do anything. Is this honoring God to use my body in this way? Man, how many things would it pull us away from and say, no, that is, that's the opposite of honoring God with your body. And I just think it just stops us in our tracks. And, and here's how Jesus ends. He lands the sermon this way. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. Enter through the narrow gate, verse 13. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to what, church? That leads to life. And Jesus says, only if you find it. Why? If it's full of life, why do only if you find it? Because in this process, it's conflicting with the desires that are in our flesh. And we don't want to turn some of those buttons off. That brings us pleasure. And so, in order to pursue God, there's a lot of things that are saying, hey, if you really want to pursue, if you re really want to, you know, have the benefits of my kingdom, th then you got to be willing to let go of these things and pursue my right way of living. And it's hard. So a lot of people say, I'm good with pocket Jesus. But again, not to sound redundant, but pocket Jesus will never allow you to enter into the kingdom of heaven. It requires king size Jesus where he gets to call the shots, where he sets the rules, and you follow under his rule. Then he goes on to say, verse 21, he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Did you catch that? But only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evil doers. This isn't a call again to perfection. This is talking to people that blatantly practice evil doing and are unapologetic about it, unrepentive. Like, that's just who I am, bro. This is what I do. Well, you can do what you want to do, and you could be how you want to be. But if you want to experience the benefits of the kingdom of heaven, that is better than anything that this world can offer you, then you got to give up your rights to follow his right to be the king of your life and to call the shots in your life. I can't tell you guys. I'm just going to sit with you for a second. Can I just sit with you? Just, just two, give me two minutes. I pray over you so much. Taryn, I pray over you guys so much. 
Some of you don't even know. We, we pray over you by name. I, don't, I know I don't know all of you, but listen to me. I have to stand before God. And I have to give an account for how I taught you guys. And this cultural trend of the church is troubling your pastor because God has so much better for you. He has so much to offer you. And, and it's like we're, we're going to the garbage can when there's a king's feast at the table. And Jesus is inviting us in to eat at the king's table. And we're settling for the garbage in the alley, thinking that that's better for us. You guys listen to me as your pastor. Please hear my heart. I love you. I don't want to condemn you. I don't want to just throw shame and guilt on you and say, you know, you do better. I'm saying it's only by the grace of God that I can sit here with you to say, God has a better way for your life. And nobody here is going to do it perfectly. But can we as a church family, can we strive to live God's way over our way? Can, can, we, can we go for it and say God has so much more to offer us than we could ever offer ourselves and start moving our life in that direction? And my friends, I'm telling you, some of the depression is going to leave immediately. Some of the anxiety is going to leave immediately. All these things, I believe, are indicators that you are participating in things that are taking your life instead of giving you life. And the kingdom of God is the only thing that this world has that is going to bring you the fullness of life. And Jesus is the king of that kingdom. And he wants to be the king of your life. So can you pray with me? Lord, I know, God, that as I sit here, Lord, I love these guys with all my heart. And my heart bleeds, God, for every woman here that has chosen abortion. God, I pray, Lord, for your healing hand of heaven to just hug them and love them and show us how we can come around them, Father. And Lord, for any woman that has maybe been abused or traumatized by something, God, I just pray your healing hand of heaven for her. But Lord, I know, God, you're calling us to something so much better. So Lord, today we want to make you king of our life. And we want your kingdom to come. And your will to be done in our life as it is in heaven. And while everyone is sitting here, you've never made Jesus king of your life. You've never surrendered to his way. Maybe he's been pocket Jesus this whole time, but now, now it's been exposed. And Jesus is saying, there's so much more I have for you. But you got to be willing to let go and repent and change your direction for your life. And if that's you and you want to bring yourself into this kingdom, it's the kingdom of heaven is both inclusive and exclusive. It's inclusive that all are welcome, that all are being called by God to enter into this kingdom and exclusive in the sense that there is a way of living that God has called us to, a higher way of living that can only happen through the Holy Spirit living in you. And if you are wanting to make that decision to become part of this unshakable kingdom, then right where you're sitting, just pray this prayer. Say, Jesus, I give you my life today. Thank you for your forgiveness towards me, for everything that you've done for me. And now I wanna live for you. The only way I can do this with your help. So fill me with your spirit as I move myself to your unshakable kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer, yeah, I love you guys and welcome to the family of God. If you pray that prayer and you text the word follow to 805-334-8700 and somebody will follow up with you and, and give you some more information about what that looks like and tell somebody uh, that you made that decision. And we love to end our time with worship. So I'm going to invite you to stand with me and stand with the team. And maybe this is a good time of reflection. We're saying, God, if there's anything in my life that is in conflict with the direction that you want me to go to live for your kingdom, then Lord, identify it so I can surrender it as we worship. But please don't run out of here. Uh, just stay in this moment of worship.
and do some business with God. The communion tables are open. Let's worship. Thank you for tuning in today to another great episode from Atmosphere Church. If this message has spoken to your heart, would you take a moment and share it with your friends? You can connect with us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and Instagram. Simply do a search for Atmosphere Church through these various platforms and then click the follow or subscribe buttons. It's another great way for us to be able to stay connected with you. If you live in the Southern California area, we would love to invite you to be part of one of our in-person gatherings. For more information about our church, go to our official website at atmosphere.church. Finally, if this episode and our other resources bless you, would you consider giving back to Atmosphere Church to support not just these things, but to also support the creation of even more resources for you? To make a donation, simply go to our website and click on the tab that says Give. Your gift of any amount is greatly appreciated. Until next time, we pray you will keep the faith, spread the hope, and live the love.